now that I have your attention, I want to tell you a story. Down below me is the Barrington Tops, remote, wild, and inaccessible. Now in 1981, that's 33 years ago, a light plane crashed, killing all on board. There were five men, five men with wives, children, and families, five men who have never been found. So tonight, for the first time, we're bringing all those pieces of the puzzle together. A puzzle that has haunted so many people for decades. As far as Australia is concerned, it's the only remaining civil aviation incident that has never been solved. This vast area where flight MDX was lost is known to pilots as the Devil's Triangle. At least seven other planes have crashed in these dangerous mountains. It's not rainforest, it's jungle. It is so dense that you couldn't see someone a metre away. You could feel the onset of terror in his voice. The pilot was calling off his altitude as he was coming down. Eight or nine seconds after that, that was it. So unnecessary. And nothing has been done in 30 years. Oh, God. The mystery of what happened to Flight MDX begins a long way from those mountain ranges. It begins with a boat captain called John Gleave, a few of his mates sailing from Sydney to the Whitsundays, and a Super 8 camera. So what was the mood like on the boat when you first oh, started off? Fantastic. A few drinks and a bit of a yahoo and a, you know, see you later type thing. The dolphins come along and leap over the bow and all that sort of thing, you know. I guess you probably didn't realise at the time though how important that no. video would become later. No. No. No idea. John Gleave's film is the last moving pictures of four good mates who would soon board Flight MDX. How would you describe them? None of them were boring. <laughs> they were all quite humorous and funny guys. Yeah. Uh, Noel Wildash wasn't called the Jolly Green Giant for no reason. <laughs> Noel Waldash, in the yellow shirt, was an engineer and a keen fisherman. On the left, Rhett Bosler, a 33-year-old finance broker who'd only been married for six months. Next to him, Inspector Ken Price, a 54-year-old career policeman and second in charge of the Sydney Water Police. He has a son and a daughter. Everywhere Dad when I went, I was always with Dad, always with Dad, yeah. Daddy's girl? Oh, yeah. Mm. On the far right, 43-year-old Philip Pembroke, a successful businessman who ran several nursing homes. A few months before the trip, he'd proposed to his girlfriend, Yvonne. Two weeks before the disappearance, we had a holiday at the snow where we had uh, discovered that I was pregnant and he was overjoyed. So you were a couple very much in love? We were very much in love, yeah. And we produced <laughs> a love child. <laughs> I call him my, our love child. Yvonne named their child Philip Jr. after his dad. What do you know about this man who carries the same name as you, <laughs> who you've never met? He was, you know, the life of the party and, and very you know, charismatic and outgoing. Um, people warmed to him. Um, you know, I, I crave to, to be able to have, um, you know, seen him move or hear his voice or any of that. I've seen lots of, you know, still photographs, obviously. Well, I've got something to show you. This was taken on the boat on the trip they did to Queensland. That's, there he that's is. That's red. There he oh, is. there he is. Oh. Oh my god. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that was 
this is sun the first burn. time of it. Oh, this is the first I've, time I've never seen, seen that either. That is amazing. <coughs> oh. <laughs> he looks so young. Wow, guys. Oh. That was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. I've got no words to describe what I've just seen there. <laughs> <laughs> John Gleave remained in the Whit Sundays, but chartered a plane to take his mates from Proserpine back home to Sydney. They'd have one refuelling stop in Coolangatta. You saw them fly off? Yep. It was the last time you saw them. Saw the plane in here, yeah. The pilot, Mike Hutchins, was experienced with almost three and a half thousand hours in the air, but only 28 hours in this type of aircraft. At around four o'clock, MDX landed in Coolangatta to refuel, and Ken Price called his daughter. He rang me from up there. I was the last person he spoke to. And uh, he said everything had gone well, so at that stage. But that wasn't the whole truth. The crash investigator's official notes revealed a witness said the pilot looked pale and a little tired and reported problems with the gyros or electrics. Should he have continued? No, if he had problems with his instruments at Coolangatta, especially if it was with the uh, artificial horizon called the attitude indicator and the directional gyro, to be flying at night in those circumstances was not sensible. He should have waited the night. But he didn't. At 5.02 p.m. they took off from Coolangatta. The destination was Bankstown Airport in southwest Sydney. Night was falling. The scheduled flight plan took them inland on a route west of Newcastle. His plan was to fly visually at night where you had to see lights and a bit of a horizon to make sure that the plane remained upright. I saw a with the starry at uh, 8,000. Uh, this is the actual flight recording. Mike Delta X-ray is the call sign for flight MDX. Mike Hart is talking to the pilot from Sydney. Was there anything out of the ordinary? No, nothing, nothing at all. It was a typical quiet uh, late evening shift. Approaching Newcastle, the pilot asked for clearance to change his flight plan and travel east along the coast. Would there be a clearance? available uh, for that aircraft coastal. I've done it. It's beautiful at night. You've got uh, William Town, you've got the lights of Newcastle ahead of you and you can see the lights of Sydney in the distance. It's a most magnificent flying area and can be done very safely as long as you can remain close to the coast where there are no mountains. But permission to take the coastal route through restricted airspace had to be given by military controllers at the RAAF base at nearby William Town. I think he would have been thinking, look, it's a Sunday night, there won't be any military aircraft flying, they'll give me a clearance straight down the coast, I'll be OK. According to Dick Smith, what happens next is critical. Instead of getting clearance, the pilot is told to wait, forcing him into a holding pattern and potentially pushing him into incoming bad weather. When they started to said you're going to be delayed and you have to go into a holding pattern, I think he would have panicked and thought, well, a holding pattern is a no-no, I'll be heading back out towards the bad weather with no horizon. I'll risk going on the normal route, which took him over the mountainous area. So MDX turns west, but the weather is now getting worse. It was a terrible night, so windy, and saw the plane and thought, who would be up in the sky on a night like this? At around 7 p.m., local farmer Lynn Laurie saw a tiny plane fly towards a giant storm front. 
you could see the line of black snow clouds parallel with the Barrington tops. It was like somebody went through the sky and cut it with scissors. It, um, one side black, the other side stars. Just a huge storm front. A huge snow cloud. Very strange scene, Bath. He was in cloud and he was having difficulty, wasn't able to climb to that altitude because he didn't even know what attitude to put the aircraft on because the attitude indicator, which tells you if you're climbing or descending, had failed. I was very concerned because that deprived him of his primary flight instruments. The ADF, or Automatic Direction Finder, was out and there was near zero visibility. He's in cloud at the moment, is he? Yes, ma'am. And he's lost his artificial horizon. And he's ADF by the sound of things. And he's ADF. Yeah, he's got problems, this boy. So he doesn't know which way is up in effect. He's looking down at his magnetic compass, it's swinging around so widely you can't use it. So it would be the most frightening situation to be in. As the temperature plummets, ice covers the wings. In effect, the aeroplane it has all this drag, and so you need more and more power to try and keep the plane airborne. Uh, my colleague, we picked up a fair amount of ice, and uh, I can just make out a few uh, down on the coast. I'd appreciate it. We could, uh, uh, oh, hell, we just uh, got in a downdraft now, and we're down at about a thousand a minute. You can hear him getting to the point where he's sort of managing it and then uh, for whatever reason the aircraft then is in a rapid rate of descent. And it gets worse. Just a compound thing, we thought we had a, a cockpit fire but uh, we seem to have resolved that little problem. The passengers would have been incredibly scared. You would be frightened. You would be frightened to death. Uh, just be my direct say, we have a little bit of a problem in that uh, the vacuum pump had failed, so there was nothing to drive the gyro. So basically, it was impossible to fly that plane. In layman's terms, without that vacuum pump, he doesn't know where his horizon is, he doesn't know north or south. He's flying blind. Yes. When he reported that he'd lost the, the vacuum pump, he's basically nearly dead. To be over the Barrington Tops at night in complete darkness in unbelievably bad weather with turbulence that you couldn't believe and lose the vacuum pump, you basically, you're dead. I mean, that's why he should have never been there. He should have been on the coast where the weather was good and he could fly low, way below the very high wind speed. These are the last recorded moments of Flight MDX. Right, don't worry, Sorry, Roger, Sydney, you're safe in that area is 6,000 at this time. If you continue heading towards the coast, towards Williamtown, sir. Right, don't worry, Sydney. Right, don't worry, Sydney. No, I don't even... <laughs> he couldn't fly towards Williamtown because he wasn't allowed to fly in the bloody controlled airspace. Oh, it is just terrible. It's the most terrible thing. I don't, I, I don't even like listening to it. Sorry, just horrible, horrible. So unnecessary. And nothing has been done in 30 years. Oh, God. was last heard of at about 7.30 last night. Seen a red glow and it was going on behind the trees. In the days, weeks, months and years since the five men disappeared, two questions remain unanswered. 
where is flight MDX? And what caused the crash? Was it pilot error, mechanical failure, or was it the fault of the RAAF, which delayed the flight, causing the pilot to fly inland into a storm? Dick Smith used to run CASA, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, which is why the views he's about to express carry such weight and are so explosive. The accident, I believe, happened when the pilot was told, as pilot gets told today, oh, you'll have to hold. There's going to be a delay because the military are going to delay you. Would there be a clearance available for that aircraft coastal? So at this point, he makes a decision to turn towards the Barrington Tops. Yep. He'd love to come down the coast over the Williamtown Air Force Base, but he's not allowed to or he's going to be delayed. So here he is, he's forced over Barrington Tops. It's just incredibly rugged. And when he went west, he got into winds up to 70 knots. That's something like 130 kilometres an hour. Put your hand out of a car at 100 kilometres an hour and feel the wind buffeting. I've flown in that area in the daytime when there's been 45 knot winds and my plane nearly got turned upside down. I've got an x-ray, Sydney. The Royal Australian Air Force, in effect, sent these five people to their deaths. If there was a flight tonight of the same type, the same thing would happen because the same restrictions apply. I checked today by ringing the briefing office and I found that the rules are still there that you can't file a flight plan across the top of Williamtown. So this is a giant roadblock. I've been five times around the world. There is nothing like this anywhere in the world where there is an Air Force base between two capital cities right on the coast and then they restrict anyone from flying through it when they've got their control zone active. And that military airspace in any other country in the world would be open to all aircraft. It is outrageous what is happening. More people will die. See, you can do something with this show if we can get those rules changed because they're gonna save lives in the future. No one's been able to do anything in 30 years. A lot of people would be mystified that it hasn't been found. Isn't it time that it was? To me, when you've got a great mystery like this, you've got to solve it. This is one of the most inhospitable places in Australia. Virtually unseen, untouched by man. And for a simple reason, the undergrowth here is so thick it's close to impenetrable. A plane wreck could be five metres that way and I'd never know it, which is why searching this area has been almost impossible for the last three decades. Now, where I am here, I can see a few metres, but the further you go up, the more you realise the scale of what these search teams are faced with. The Barrington Tops is holding a secret and it's hidden somewhere in more than 760 square kilometres of thick rolling bushland. Hold on, live inside me, leave me on my way. Imagine the fame that goes to the person who finds it. And also the thanks from the families and from the relatives. They'd certainly like closure on this. Leave me home, leave me home. As far as Australia is concerned, MDX remains the biggest unsolved mystery. OK, just take us uh, down over that uh, area again where you think that the aircraft actually flew. And we've determined the flight path of the aircraft was along this line. Retired pilot Don Redford has written a book on MDX and spent 12 years investigating the mystery. A few minutes later on the 330 degree bearing, 
at this point here, and then one and a half minutes later, it was all over, and they're scattered top now, and that's where we believe the aircraft has come to grief. Don's crash site is here at Scattertop Mountain. It's 10 kilometres further along the flight path from the primary search area at Carey's Peak. Straight out there, that is Scattertop Mountain. And not only has Don identified it as the crash site, he's even narrowed it down to just one square kilometre. And Don believes science is the missing link to solving the mystery. I think with technology today, I think uh, probably the use of a magnetometer uh, strapped to underneath a helicopter, there may be uh, the chance of an indication of where the wreckage of the aircraft lies. In simple terms, this magnetometer is an airborne metal detector. It's used in mining to locate metal deposits underground. Today, it's being used to search for the wreckage of MDX. It's happening. I never thought in my <laughs> wildest dreams that I've ever said, come to this, to this stage. I never thought it would. It's, this is absolutely fantastic. It really is. The magnetometer sends a live stream of data back to base to be analysed. Meanwhile, a small ground crew wearing cameras and carrying portable magnetometers begins a four-hour trek to the location. You're doing a great job up there, Bernie, and I've got my fingers and toes crossed for you. The helicopter sweeps back and forth in a grid pattern, and it's a nervous time for Don. Then, suddenly, the machine goes off. Copy there, Gary. Go ahead, over. Yeah, got some good news for you. Uh, we have a target. I'd say it's it's a lot less than a ton of steel. It'd be in the hundreds of kilos, which is a, a perfect uh, in the range of the target that we're looking for. Light is fading. It's a race against time to get there. A hard slog. There's a, another potential target about 50 metres north, which is very exciting because it indicates, you know, there could be a cluster of targets from an aeroplane over. The ground team closes in. And the closer they get, the tougher the terrain. And then something out of the ordinary. You like the way all these trees are knocked down here? There's three of them all knocked down in a row here. Could these be the signs of a crash site? It's just funny for this to be just open like this. Like, this is pretty hard to search here. It needs to be a big search. There could be stuff over it anywhere. We feel like it needs uh, more of a search, Ava. Sorry, Don. You're right. Not today. <laughs> that's right. It's just a start, yeah. though. Yeah, just that's start. right. What percentage of your area was searched today? I would say only approximately about 10% of the total area. So there's a lot more to go yet. This is only the beginning. The beginning of the mystery. The final moments of the flight. A powerful reminder for the families and for all those searching of why MDX needs to be found. One day someone has to have an answer, has to be able to resolve what happened and where that aircraft is. We need to solve this one. I want to see closure for all the families. Just so that we all know what happened, that's all we want to know. That, to me, would be the greatest satisfaction. It mean everything to me. Um, I would love to be able to have it found and, and then to, to bring Dad home and, and you know, have a, a proper... We never had a funeral for him. Hold on, heaven's waiting, open up your door. Hold on, heaven's waiting, open up your door. Leave me home. Leave me home. Leave me home. Leave me home. 
Leave me 